We will go ahead and start turning to 1 Timothy 6. 6 through 12 is going to be our passage. We'll get there in just a second. And I always mention, as Lewis did, through the door on the right hand side are the outlines, and they will have most of the verses I will use. Before I get to our passage, how many of you guys know the kind of person that if, if they were to win a, a brand new expensive house, they're the kind of person that would complain that the door was the wrong color, or they'd complain that it was, it was too big, or the list would go on and on. Because most of us know that there are people out in the world today that it doesn't really matter how good they've got it, they'll sit and complain. They're just not content. Now, as I talk about this subject, let me, let me tell you, I, I do struggle a little bit in really trying to explain this topic in a way that makes sense, because I think most of us, uh, at some point would say that there are things in this life that cause us uh, stress and anguish um, and cause us a lot of concern. But with all that being said, as Christians, we need to understand what contentment is. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about contentment. And let's start off by acknowledging first that, that we live in a day and age where the majority of people are never truly content. We see it going on around us all the time. There are people... Uh, that are constantly wanting something newer, they want something better, they want something fancier, they want something bigger, they want something different, and the list goes on and on and on. Most of us have seen uh, this take place in our life. And it applies to reality, in reality, everything that, uh, that we have. It applies to our houses, it applies to all of our cars and our possessions. Uh, we'll find that it applies to religion. There are people always out there looking for something bigger or something better. It, replies, it applies sometimes even to their spouses. How many of you have seen something like that take place? Yeah, I've had my spouse for quite a while, and now it's time to move up to something better. It's hard sometimes to get people to understand what the Bible has to actually say about contentment. Now, as I talk about contentment, let me say this. I am not suggesting for a second that, that we as Christians should not want self-improvement. I'm not suggesting that that you, you shouldn't want to improve your health or, or your appearance. I'm not suggesting that if, if you have a job that you're not happy with, you ought to just be content to stay in that type of a job. I'm not suggesting that at all. And I'm not suggesting that we as Christians should take on some lifestyle of poverty and then uh, in all of that being said, you know, act that we're happy. I'm not saying that at all. But as Christians, we ought to be content. And we ought to be able to be content in really whatever situation it is that we're dealing with. Now again, with that being said, there are some situations in life where I want you to understand that's not going to be easy, and I'll mention a few of those here in a little bit. But as Christians, we ought to have contentment in this world. We ought to also be able to look at other people around us that we know aren't content. Most of us are familiar with those, especially outside the body, who, who truly do not have contentment. And we ought to be able to notice that so that we can point them to the source of our contentment. <clears throat> now, I told you I was going to go to 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 12. I want you to follow along with me. Paul's really going to hit this head on as he writes to Timothy. We probably really should go back and read the whole chapter, but we'll just let these few verses uh, take place here and, and be sufficient. He says to Timothy, <clears throat> But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment or clothing, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith, and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness." Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast prophetic, professed a good profession before many witnesses. You look here in 1 Timothy 6, 6-12, and Paul is discussing oftentimes man's desire to go out and get more and more and more, as he puts it, mammon. Not a word that we use. I would probably guess that most of you don't ask your boss when you're going to get your mammon for the week. He's talking about wealth. He's talking about what the world would consider material or, or wealthy gain. But notice Paul makes a distinction and he says to, to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Now, again, many in the world around us, they truly cannot understand this. Not because they're not sincere, not because many of them uh, are not spiritual, as we've talked about. There are many around us who are spiritual. There are many who are, are seeking, and yet they've not had the opportunity to either hear the gospel or they've not yet obeyed it. And because of that, they can't understand what true Christian contentment is. It's a struggle for not only those outside the church, but also for those inside the church. And oftentimes the reason is because is they're struggling with their personal ambitions. We probably could have listed a million things, but sometimes it's for wealth. Sometimes it's just for certain possessions. How many of you have watched some of those shows on TV where people have unusual things where they have to collect like kittens? Or I saw a lady's house where she must have had, must have had like 8,000 kittens in her house. That brought her contentment. Uh, there's people out there looking for all different types of things. Some are seeking after beauty. There are those who are seeking after popularity. They simply want to be somebody in this world. There are those who are seeking out after things such as addictions. Because for them, that's what, that's what brings them contentment. The problem is, is they just don't understand what the Bible has to teach about contentment. It's common in the everyday world around us. If you want an example of it, how many of you ever watched any of those reality TV shows? It's interesting that most of those people that are on there, you can tell they're not content. As a matter of fact, they often entertain people who watch them. And you know why the people watch them? Because <clears throat> oftentimes they're in the exact same situation where they're not content either. And so for some reason, I don't know why, they like to watch these other people in these, content, in these, in these reality shows. How many of you have heard that phrase, misery, misery loves company? Oftentimes that takes place with those who are not content in this life. And so I want you to ask yourself, before we really dive into this, are you really content with your life? I mean, really? There are some that would be here and would say, yeah, I am. And they have a, a mature understanding of contentment. There are others that would be here and they would say, maybe at this point, hopefully after the sermon they'll change their opinion. Maybe at this point they would say, you know, I, I really don't think that I am. I don't think that I'm content. I want to notice a few things about contentment, but I'm going to start off talking about what contentment is not first. Because a lot of people have a wrong idea about contentment. <clears throat> first of all, I want us to understand that contentment, it's not conceit. It's not excessive pride. I mean, there are some people out there who have the idea that contentment is really conceit. You probably know people like this. They think that I'm the one who is smart. I'm the one who is uh, beautiful. I'm the one who, who has... Uh, whatever it is that they think places them on a pedestal above other people. And because of that, they think they're better than other people. And because of that, they have this false understanding or, or a feeling of contentment. How many of you ever known somebody like that? They're usually the kind of person, and I, I'll never forget, I, was, I even remember where I was. I was walking in the uh, barn pasture there towards the milk house, and I was talking about people who put people down. And I remember my dad stopped me and he said, you know why people do that? And I didn't know the answer. No, I don't. He said, it's because they already have a problem with themselves, and the only way for them to make themselves feel better or content is to put somebody else down so they can try to lift themselves up. There are people like that in this world, okay? There are people who, their whole goal is to feel like they're better than somebody else. And it could be because of their wealth. It could be because of their name. There are people who think they're better than other people because of their gender, because of their nationality, because of their race, some even because of their religion. People even in the church are guilty of this sometimes, saying, you know, I think I'm better than that person because that person's not a member of the church. I will tell you, you're better off. I agree with you there. But you're not any better. You're just better off. And I'll explain that here in just a second. And so these people, they look at all these worldly things, and because of these worldly things, they think that they are better than somebody else. And they are immensely satisfied. In their mind, they may even say they are content. They have a contentment. But I'm going to tell you this right now. What they have is not Christian contentment. That's not at all what they have. They simply have contentment that's found in the world, based on the world's standards, right? Right? Uh, I'm, I'm attractive, I'm well off, I have, and the list goes on and on. That's how the world judges people. That's not how Christians judge people, and it's certainly not how God judges us. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 12.2. He says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Contentment for the Christian is based on biblical standards, not the world's standards. And I'm going to tell you, and it's sad, and most of you know it and you've seen it, the world is slowly infiltrating and tearing apart the church, one family at a time. How many families would it take this congregation to lose before we were struggling just like everyone else? How many? Three? Four? That only takes one spouse out of each family to become unfaithful, to drag, drag the other one away, and then the family's gone, right? That's happening to congregations because people are looking for contentment out in the world and they have no idea what are even the standards uh, for biblical contentment. And so we as Christians need to understand that that's something that we ought to be focusing on, both in our marriages, our families, and the list goes on and on. We as Christians understand contentment uh, is not conceit. And it can't be for a number of reasons. But first of all, we know that it's not conceit because God made everybody equal. With that being said, I will make a, uh, a note here. But listen to Acts 10.34. Then Peter opened his mouth and he said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And you may say, <clears throat> well, people aren't necessarily equal. Jerry's better at electronical stuff than I, uh, electronic stuff and wiring and stuff than I am. John's better at working on cars than I am. There are people in this congregation that are better in all kinds of things than I am. There are some things maybe that I'm better at than they are. They're not any better than me, and I'm not any better than them. You know why? It's because what's inside. I'm not talking about their heart. What is the value of his soul and her soul and her soul and his soul? Can you put a value on somebody's soul? You give me the poorest man who has nothing, and you give me the billionaire who has everything, and when they die, guess what's left? Just their soul. And they're both worth the exact same thing. The idea that people would try to place themselves above other people, to be honest with me, is just disgusting. Because God doesn't look at it like that. Each soul has value. And so we're not to think higher than ourselves of others. Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we would think this way if we quit looking at the external. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to wear a nice suit when I come here. Okay, That's my scruple. Don't judge me on my suit, though. What if, I, what if my house were to burn down and I had nothing? We need to judge each other on the basis of our soul and the worth of our soul. If we were to do that, we would stop the division that we find in the church based on ethnicity, race, nationality. I don't care what it is. If we would devalue the soul of the individual, that would all stop. And we ought to because we understand that Jesus came and he died for everybody. Everybody in particular. 1 John 4, 14 and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Why? Because each person's soul has the same value, right? And so we understand very clearly it can't be, con it can't be because of conceit. That's not where contentment is found. Notice again in 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. Uh, we think oftentimes like the world wants us to think, but we need to understand the ways of, of God are not the ways of man. For ye see your calling, brethren, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 29, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. It's interesting, when I got into my car this morning, I'm coming here to worship with you all, to have Bible study, and it's interesting that, that that brings me contentment. And as we got in the car, there was a gentleman riding by on his bicycle. <clears throat> he, had on the, he had the full get-up on and the helmet, and he was, he was, you know why? That's what he does to bring, bring him contentment. Where's his focus at? Worldly things. Certainly he could have done that later in the day, right? 
But he didn't because that's what brings him contentment. We need to understand that conceit and lifting us up while we try to push other people down and we judge people based on whatever it is to make ourselves feel better, that's not contentment. <clears throat> that's a problem with worldly standards. Let's also understand that Christian contentment's not laziness. You may say, well, what do you mean by that? <clears throat> there are some people that think that contentment is, is just being completely happy where you are, even if you're not accomplishing anything in life. There's people that think being content is being lazy and not have any goals. Um, there are people that are, that are out there and they're poor and they have no intent to do anything about it. They're fine with it. There are people who, who are, they'll say, my health's not very good and I know I could do something about it, but I don't want to. I'm content with the way that I am. There are people that would say, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a horrible job. I hate my boss and I really don't even think I make enough money and yeah, I guess I'm content with that. There are people that might say, you know, I'm in a bad marriage and I'm even the, I'm even the reason that it's bad. And I'm content with it. I tell you, all of those things are not what we're talking about here. Just because you're in a situation and you don't want to do anything about it, that's not contentment, okay? I want you to realize, you know, that there are people, even in the Lord's body, where they don't go out and work and provide for their families. And they might say, you know, I'm content with that. You gotta ask yourself, how content do you think their families are? How many of you have ever known where a, where a child uh, was struggling in the church because the parents they weren't doing what they needed to do to provide? And I'm not just talking physically; I'm talking spiritually too. But it happens both ways. There are some people who they work and they're fairly well off, but they don't use even a little bit of that money to help somebody else that's not well off. Uh, they've got so much money coming at, coming out their pockets that. You know, they're just throwing it away on stuff, and yet they don't help anybody. You really ought to go back and ask, well, how content are the needy people who, who are just looking for a little bit of something, and yet nobody wants to help them? There are a lot of people who are never motivated to go out and to do anything for the Lord. They're content just to sit back and relax. Why should you ask yourself, how content are those who are lost, even if they don't know that they're lost? And you may say, well, that's kind of a hard question to answer. The lost have a poverty, even if they're well off. But I'm going to tell you their poverty is of mind and soul and spirit, okay? There are a lot of rich people out there in the world who are poor in spirit. Uh, and many of them, they're not content because of it. They're looking for something. And yet you've got those who don't even want to go out and try to teach them. So contentment is not just saying, I'm in this current position and I'm fine with whatever it is. That's not contentment. And we understand that that's not Christian contentment, talking about laziness and so forth. God expected us from the very beginning to work for what we have. Listen to what Paul uh, tells the, the church there in Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. He says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them which are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their bread, eat their own bread. I'm going to tell you the Bible from the very beginning condemns laziness. It just condemns it. I'm going to tell you what, it doesn't matter what you do, and let's cover everybody. It doesn't matter whether you are the husband and you're the only one working. You need to work hard. It doesn't matter if you're a wife who is working in the, in the world out there. You need to work hard. It doesn't matter if you're a, as they call it, I, I don't use this term, but a stay-at-home mom. If you're at home working, doing the clothes and all the stuff that you do while your husband's out working, you need to work hard. Let's turn it around because I know a guy when I was working, he, he stays at home and his wife works. If that's your situation while you're home, you need to work hard. Why do I tell you all this? You know, in, in my profession where I worked at before, I have seen lazy uh, factory workers. For those of you who've worked in a factory, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who've worked in a factory, I've seen lazy engineers. I've seen lazy cell people. Uh, the list goes on and on. I have seen lazy teachers in school. I'm going to tell you a secret you might not. I've seen lazy preachers. Lazy. Didn't put any, of their time, didn't put any time into their studies at all. And put any time into their Bible study. They literally got to the front door and went, yeah, that's it. That's the one I'm doing. How good do you think that sermon was? 
What's my point? We have been expected as Christians to work hard at whatever we're doing as if we're doing it for the Lord. And you know why? Because we are. With that being said, I want you to understand that no matter where you are and you're working and you may not be happy with it, uh, you're supposed to work hard because the guy hired you or whoever hired you to give this amount of work to earn, earn this res- amount of pay. I had a guy come and tell me one time, he said, you know, I don't get paid enough. I don't make enough money. You know what I asked him? I said, did you agree to take that job for X amount of money? And he said, yeah. And I said, and that guy expected you to work X amount of hours. Now, if you don't like the arrangement, continue to work hard per the original agreement while you look for another job. Okay? But while you're there as a Christian, you need to work and fulfill that obligation. Okay? Paul goes on in, in 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. How many would you like to be described like that? It's very simple. The Bible talks about uh, those of us who are Christians working hard. He wants us to provide for our families. He doesn't want us to just provide for our families. We know Galatians 6.10 that we're to do good unto all men. That's not in your notes. You can add that if you want. But I, I, I want you to understand he also wants us to help the poor. Now, most of us would have to admit I don't have enough money. I'm not a... I'm not a philanthropist, and I don't have a ton of money that I can just go out and give to people. There are some that do. But listen to Ephesians 4.28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now, certainly that's going to include your family, but it might also include your neighbor. It might also include somebody down the road that you know who, who is struggling a little bit. Uh, I never, I never knew about this when I was younger, and my grandfather's not around now to ask. <clears throat> but my, uh, he used to own a, a number of businesses, and uh, it's funny he never went to church until right before he died. Uh, but my mom said she can remember that he would always throughout the year look for a family that was struggling, specifically one that would have children, and he would pick them sometime throughout the year, and he never told anybody. And he would, he would set aside toys and clothing and shoes. And then at Christmas, he would go and just put them on their back step and leave. Why do I tell you all that? There are people around us who they need somebody to help them. And a lot of those people are good people who are working as hard as they can. And they're still not making ends meet for a number of reasons. It could be because somebody's sick in their family and it costs $15,000 a year to pay for their medicine. We really don't always know the specifics. But we ought to be willing to help other people. I want you to listen to what Jesus said because with the fact that we ought to be able to help other people, I want you to I want you to know that our primary focus is to help people spiritually. There are people around us who may think that they're content. They're going to find out, unfortunately, that, that what they thought was contentment is not. And so we need to be working in the kingdom just like Jesus, just like the disciples, as he's told us to do. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's true. That's true. We don't have enough laborers. Um, listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3.9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. You know, it's kind of sad. I, and I might have mentioned this before. I went to a congregation... I was preaching at a couple different congregations. We're trying to decide where we were going to go. This is right after I got out of school. <clears throat> I went to this congregation that was down to, I want to say they had 22 or somewhere in that area. And the, the gentleman said, well, we've, we've been dwindling over the years. We continue to dwindle. And he said, what, what can you do to save this congregation? What can you do? Would that scare you if you heard somebody say something like that? I said, how long... How long has this congregation been here? We've been there for like 40 years, 50 years. And he said, well, we just keep dwindling. And I said, how many people have you taught lately? Guess what the answer to that one was? None. 40 people in a congregation, and they're looking to hire a minister to save the congregation. I know congregations that don't have a minister that are growing. Where's the problem? We don't have enough laborers. You can hire the best preacher in the world, which I'm not, 
And that doesn't mean you're gonna, your congregation is going to grow at all. Because I'm going to be honest, the majority of people, they're not saved from the pulpit. They're saved from the people who aren't behind the pulpit. Those who are teaching the neighbors, teaching their cousins that aren't converted, teaching the guy they work with on the assembly line while they're sitting there doing... I'll tell you, I had some of the weirdest conversations working on the factory, and some of those were about religion. There are not enough workers out working. We ought to be spreading the gospel so that other people besides us can have an idea of what contentment actually is because they just don't know. Our message is one of contentment. We looked at it in Bible study. Why don't we sum it up like this? As bad as this world is, if you're faithful when you die, where do you go? Heaven. Can you get any more content than that? If you were to understand it? Christian contentment's not being self-satisfied. Why do I have to bring that up? Some think that contentment's being satisfied with the idea of their own personal salvation. And what I mean is, is that there are some who, there are some that think they get the ticket punched. Good to go, right? I did what I needed to do once for some people in some religious groups. I did what I needed to do once, and now I'm a Christian and I am good to go. Doesn't matter what I do, doesn't matter what I say. There are some that have the idea of, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, I'm going to heaven. That's what I was taught in the Catholic Church. That's the exact same thing I was taught in the Catholic Church. You're a Catholic, you get to go to heaven. I mean, if you know a member of the church that I'm a member of the Church of Christ, so I get to go to heaven. Yeah, go back and let's read Matthew 7, 13, 14, and Matthew uh, 7, 21. Uh, there's a whole lot of problems with that thought process, right? Just because you're a member of the church doesn't mean you're faithful. Just because you're a member of the church doesn't mean that you're going to be found faithful. And so there are those, though, who are content with the idea that now that I'm part of the church, or now that I've been saved, guess what? I can continue. To, I don't have to work anymore. I don't have to work. I don't even have to be faithful for some. For some, it's, you know, God doesn't really care if I go to church once a week or whether it's once a year. I go on Easter and Christmas. That's pretty good. He knows that I love him. I feel him in my heart, right? I mean, if you know somebody like that, they're content with the idea that, that they're going to make it to heaven. We know that contentment is not based on our idea of self-satisfaction. Uh, and I know that for those who call, who call themselves Christians because God expects us as a family. And we talked about brothers and sisters and being brothers and sisters in Christ last week or the week before. He expects us as a family to live as a family and to come together and gather as a family every Lord's Day, right? He didn't say just do it right, after you, right before and after you obey the gospel. Every Lord's Day. That, that, that means all up until you die. There's a commitment there, okay? Uh, when you got married, my guess is, for those of you who are men, your wife expected you to come home probably every day, right? Yeah, we're expected to gather together as a body every Lord's Day. We don't get to pick and choose. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. That assembling is not limited to just Sunday. That covers all the assemblings when we come together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Matter of fact, the closer you get to this day approaching, the more you all be wanting to gather together with fellow Christians and assemble together, okay? Christianity requires constant action. Constantly. It's not, it's not a one-time thing. It's not something you can let dwindle either. You put it into effect the day you put Christ on, and you keep it there, and it stays in the forefront at all times. You start to base your contentment on anything other than that, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a serious problem. We can never do enough, we understand, to earn our own salvation. Uh, I've had people accuse me, oh, you think, that, you think you can do things and get to heaven. No, I don't. I've never taught that, and I don't believe it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you that I'm an imperfect man who sometimes still makes, mis makes mistakes, but it is only by the blood of Jesus Christ, 1 John 1, 7 through 9, that I can repent of those things and still be found faithful. You know why? Because God's full of mercy and grace and love. Listen to Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved through the faith. If your translation does not have the word the in there, put it in there. It's in the original language. You're saved through the faith, the system of faith, the gospel, the entire New Testament. You're saved through that faith. He's not talking about some mental ascent and I believe in Jesus. You're saved through the faith, the law of Christ. And he says, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. He didn't have to save you but He loves you enough that He gave a way of salvation so you could be saved. That's a God of mercy and comfort. 
you ought to have contentment in that kind of God. And knowing that His promises, they'll be carried out. You'll eventually get to this place called heaven. And so because of all that, we've got to continue to assess ourselves and check ourselves whether we are actually in the faith. Listen to 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. You guys have heard somebody say, I don't remember what TV show it was on, but said, you best check yourself. That's what Paul's saying right there. You best check yourself. We've already covered it. You're going to be, you're going to be judged according to the Word, John 12, 48. That's how you're going to be judged. You better check yourself and see if you're in alignment with that Word. There are a lot of people out there claiming to be Christians who are not. And Paul makes it very clear. Christianity is a walk of faithfulness that starts from the time I put Christ on in baptism till the very end of the day I die. That's where contentment is found. I can never think that I've done enough. So you may say, well, you just covered a whole bunch of stuff about what Christian, what, what Christian contentment is not. Well, what is it? <clears throat> I can't cover all that in one sermon. I'm going to cover some basics. First of all, contentment is living within one's means. There are a lot of people today who don't live within their means. It's especially a problem here in the United States. Most of us know somebody. <coughs> there is a desire by many to continuously have more uh, and newer and better things. How many of you in here have ever got that new car? I haven't had a new car in years. <coughs> but do you remember at the dealer when you actually sat down in it and you went, you remember that smell? Yeah, you know what, after about two years, it just smells like baby vomit and whatever else they've put in there. That new smell car, that new car smell doesn't last. It doesn't last. And you know what happens when it's gone? <clears throat> you want another new one, right? Well, I can't remember the last time I actually had a new car. It's that, it's that idea. You've all seen it, right? Let's keep up with the Joneses. He got a new car next door, or, or he did this next door, or I've seen what they have, and it's nice, and I really want it. Um... Because of that, there are people out chasing something that they really they have no business chasing. <clears throat> and in so doing, they oftentimes will go out and they'll max out credit cards. The amount of debt that we have today is actually astonishing and it's overwhelming. Uh, I don't, let me say this. There is nobody in here, probably, who has never done this. Because I know as soon as you turn 18, they start sending you the credit cards, and I remember the first one I got. I bought an Optimus receiver. I still have it, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> it still sounds good. And guess what? I paid a whole lot more for that receiver than I would have paid if I bought it in cash. So the acquiring of debt has caused all types of problems with families and marriages, both in, in the world and also with those in the church. And, and let me mention just a word of caution <coughs> as I state that. Uh, if you ever see me out, you'll notice I pay with a debit card. I don't carry cash on me. I use a debit card. There's a big difference between a debit card and a credit card. A debit card means I have cash in the bank, and when I use it, they pull the cash from my bank. If I'm using a credit card, that means I don't have any cash. So that guy's going to give it to me, but he doesn't just give it to me. He's not like, it's not like my buddy down the street that gives me a $10 bill. They let me use it, but then they charge me interest on top of it. So not only did I just pay for the food that cost me $15, in eight years when I pay it off, I've actually paid about $35 or $40 for that one meal because I paid interest on it for eight years. We oftentimes don't think about that. So the problem is not only that I'm acquiring debt, it's that I'm paying interest on top of it. Why do I have to tell you all that? <clears throat> well, as Christians, we ought to understand that we have to live within our means, okay? Um, I'll tell you this, before school, <clears throat> my last job, uh, before I went down to school, I would say probably by the national standard, I lived in poverty <clears throat> based on my income and family size. Um, I lived in a, I rented a three-bedroom house there was two, two people per room. That includes me. I had to share a room with somebody, too. We were all in this little house. I barely had enough money to pay the rent. You just caught that, didn't you? I barely had enough money to pay the rent. I had enough money to pay my insurance. I had no new cars, so I had no car payments. And I had enough money to buy food. We had, my kids remember, we had no cable. We had, for, at, at first, we had no internet. We had nothing. I don't remember it all being miserable. I remember it was tight. But I don't remember being miserable. But I will tell you this, I didn't have anything. We didn't have anything. Uh, and so we need to understand that we have to live within our means. I didn't want to stay in that position. I didn't. 
And for those of you who are in that position, you don't have to either. That goes back to what I just talked about 10 minutes ago when I talked about working hard. People who work hard, I don't care where you're working or what you're doing, those people excel. Uh, I hadn't finished my college and I had, I had worked my way up to where I was running the entire manufacturing facility at one point. I hadn't even finished my degree yet. Why? I was a hard worker. Probably too hard uh, now that I look back at it, at least because of what I was doing. In contrast, we as Christians know contentment means living within one's means. That's exactly what Paul was talking about in 1 Timothy uh, 6, 6 through 12 that we open with. It's what Jesus talked about. If you go back and look in Matthew 6, 19 through 34, <clears throat> we're, to, we're to be free from the love of money and debt. Listen to Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conversation, your manner of life, be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, we're told in Romans 13, 8, we're to, we're to owe no man anything, right? Except for to love. I think Jesus probably did the best job of summing it all up for us in Matthew 6, 11, where he said, Give us this daily bread. You know what? If all I have is the clothes on my back for the day and enough to eat, I really should be content. I really should. It's easy for me to tell you that from the pulpit. But I'm going to be honest with you. There are, there are things that I struggle with as much as anybody else. This week, I, I can recall sitting down just saying, you know, I'm not happy with a certain situation. I'm not happy with it. Most of you have had a situation take place where there's nothing you can do about it. How many of you have been in a situation where there's something happening, you have no control over it? None. Control is oftentimes an illusion for us in this world. Uh, people die. John lost a loved one, what, two weeks, three weeks ago. There's nothing John could do about that. There's nothing. He can be content, but is it easy? It's not. It's not. There are certain things that happen around us. People get sick. Nothing I can do about that. I wish that I could. And you may ask yourself, how do I learn to be content in a situation like that? The Bible has the answers for that. Contentment is being happy regardless of one's situations. We've all been there. We struggle with situations. Bad jobs, bad marriages, I'm not making quite enough money, I'm struggling, the list goes on and on and on. And what we understand, we can be happy in those situations. There are people out in the world, they're unhappy. I don't care in what situation they are. There are millionaires and billionaires who are out there who are miserable, unhappy people that you would never want to be friends with. Even if they were giving you money and stuff that you want. You know why? Because they're miserable people because they're not content with life. With all that being said, I'm going to tell you, I have known people who were poor as poor can be. And they were, they were so content. Uh, you won't find this much, but actually in the town closest to where I lived, there were still houses that had dirt floors. You guys ever seen a house with a dirt floor? One of the supervisors I worked with, he grew up in a house with a dirt floor. Uh, my baseball coach, I talk about him quite often, Clay Roberts. Uh, his daughter was terminally ill. They kept telling him she's got six months to live. They've been telling him, they told him that for 15 years. She's got six months to live. She's still alive. His house burned down, lost everything that he had. Everything. And somebody said, hey, I got an old log cabin that nobody lives in. You can li he lived with his wife and his daughter who was terminally ill. He was our janitor at school. How much money do you think he made? with a terminally ill daughter. He's the happiest guy I've ever seen in my life. He wasn't a member of the church. I wish he was. If I want to be happy like somebody, I'd like to emulate that guy. Because no matter how hard life seemed to kick him, he was content. We as Christians understand that we can be content regardless of our personal situations. Listen to what Paul writes to the Philippian church. Philippians 4, 11, and 12. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You know, after Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into pr prison, 
They're sitting there singing praises to God. Acts 16, 25. How many of you, if you were beaten and thrown into prison because of your faith, would be sitting there singing to God? A lot of people would be belly aching and crying, right? Oh, look how the world's treated me. Look at what the world's done to me. And yet, there they are. And you wonder, you know, how, how in the world could two people do that? They knew contentment. That's the true understanding of contentment. We talked about it even in Bible study. What's the worst they could do to you? Kill you? What happens if they kill you? Where do you go if you're faithful? Heaven. That's biblical contentment. Listen to 1 Corinthians 4, 11 and 12. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are naked, and we're buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. We don't have any, any place to lay our head down. He says, and labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. You imagine living like that, and yet, in all of those situations, being content? He's describing the situation for many gospel preachers at the time. And you may say, how is it that those people could bless and be rejoiced when the Roman government was persecuting people like that and the Jews were chasing them down and hassling them all the time? Because they understood Christian contentment. Contentment is the peaceful self-assurance of our salvation, no matter what's going on around us. And why do I have to come back to that? You can't always control what's going on around you. We have bad things that happen to us even though we are faithful Christians. And yet with all that being said, we understand that we can be content. The world doesn't want you to, to, to understand this idea. The world has us so trapped into this idea that if I don't have stuff and if I don't make enough money and if, if, if people don't know who I am or I'm not somebody in the brotherhood and the list goes on and on and on, they want you to have this idea that you're, you're never going to be content. I just don't get it. You know, I've, I've had, some, had some people who've asked different times, do you, do you like to go out and do gospel meetings and things like that? I've done, I've done one, and I didn't want to. <laughs> I did it because he was a friend and he wanted me to come do it. I enjoyed it while I was there. Do you know, to be honest, I have no desire to leave my Christian family here. I just want to work here in this community. Uh, could I go and do that and preach? I could. I don't have any desire to do that. I'd rather just stay here until I die, I guess. Uh, but there are some people out there that they think they've got to go become somebody in whatever field it is, whether they're, whether they're religiously talking about what they do in the church or whether they're working for a company. They've got this idea that unless I'm the, the best and the top in the job, then I, I'm never going to be content. You know, They've got these goals and they think that I've got to rise to the point where everybody else is below me or I won't be, con I won't be content. All of that is due to an improper view on the world, uh, money, power, fame. None of those things bring contentment. You go back and you look at the book of Ecclesiastes. You want to have some idea about contentment? That was a guy that chased after every avenue of contentment, and guess what he said when he wrote Ecclesiastes? I tried it all, and guess what? It didn't work. So let me tell you what does. And in essence, what he told us was, be faithful to God. We know that the physical is not what brings us contentment. It's the spiritual. It's the spiritual things. You've got to remember, Jesus gave up everything. Riches. I can't, even, I can't even comprehend in my mind what it is that Jesus had up there before he took upon him the form of man and lived down here so that he could shed his blood so that we could go to heaven. Right? He took upon him the form of a servant. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. And ultimately, that goes back to the shedding of His blood, right? That's where true contentment is found. The blood of Jesus Christ. And He taught us to value the spiritual, not the physical. Matthew 6, 19-24. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <clears throat> the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of light. 
shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Wealth. Pick this day whom you will serve, right? That's where contentment is at. It is godliness that brings us contentment. Not new TVs. Not new cars. Not new houses. The list goes on and on. We need to trust in God because that brings contentment. Let me close with 1 Timothy 6, 17-19. Paul, he says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they not be given, that they be not high-minded. Let me stop for a minute. There's nothing wrong with having money in this world. If you have lots of it, I hope you use it for your family and also for some other people, and I hope you use it to enlarge the kingdom. I know a lot of men who are faithful who have a lot of money. Okay, I know a lot more people who are faithful who don't have hardly any. He says, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. There's where your focus ought to be, right? It's not, it's not the money. He said, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. That pretty much sums it up right there, doesn't it? Your focus ought to be on God. Why? So you can lay hold on eternal life. I don't even think I touched the hem of the garment today on getting you to understand what Christian contentment is. I probably could have preached for another two hours, and I still could, but you guys want to go home. Christian contentment is not conceit. It's not. It's not laziness. It's not self-satisfaction. None of those things and a whole host of other things are contentment. But here's what it is. It is learning to live within one's means. And I'm not saying that you have to stay where you're at now. I hope you do continue to excel and grow and prosper so that you're well off. But it's living within our means and it's being happy in spite of cir circumstances that you can't control. It's when somebody's sick and when somebody dies and when some bad things happen that you have no control over, that you can look at yourself and say, you know what? As bad as that is, and as much as I'm struggling to get through that and to wrap my hands around it, I can be content. Because in the end, when I die, I know that this world's only temporary and I'm going to get to go to heaven. And so contentment's living within our means, being happy in every circumstance or being at, being at peace at least and having a peacefulness due to the knowledge of our salvation because we know that again we don't need to fear the world around us we only need to fear him that can draw me away from it so as I draw this to a close I want you to ask yourself are you content? do you think a little bit different now about contentment and what we as Christians ought to be focusing on? If you're here today and you're not a Christian, let me tell you this, as straightforward as I can. If you're not a Christian right now, you can't truly understand contentment. You can't. And I assure you, if you were to die in that situation, you're not going to find anything but misery. So let me tell you how to solve that problem. The Bible's very clear that every person who was added to the body heard somebody teaching the gospel. Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People taught the gospel and there were those who heard it and believed it. Hebrews 11, 6 and John 8, 24. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that He took upon Him flesh, and that He died and shed His blood so that our sins could be forgiven. Because they understood that, they wanted to obey what Jesus Himself said in Luke 13, 3. I tell you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. They were willing to repent of their sins because they understood the consequence of sins. Romans 3, 23, For all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, The consequence for that is death. They also understood that they needed to confess the name of Christ. Jesus Himself made it very clear and said, If you will not confess Me before men, neither shall I confess you before My Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And they also wanted to obey His command to be baptized and added to the body. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Jesus very clearly said this is how one is added to the body. Those that did that were added to the church. Acts 2, 
verse 47. If you are here right now and you have not done what I just told you and gave you Bible verses for, please do not leave. Please do not leave without talking to me. Because I assure you, you are not guaranteed tomorrow and neither am I. Make sure that you're found right in God's sight. Because that's the only place you're ever going to find contentment. If you're here and you're a Christian and you say, I'm struggling in some other area, I'm struggling with contentment in this life, we'd love to pray for you. You can make either of those situations known as we stand and sing a song of invitation.